Hey everyone, I'm Nick from Coffee Before Arch, and in this episode of C++ Crash Course, we're going to be talking about cache associativity and the impacts that uh, the way you access data can have on performance. And so we've already looked at you know how access patterns can affect performance in a number of different ways. So last time we looked at prefetching, and we showed that you know if you access something in row major order, well you get some great locality because you're accessing consecutive elements; they'll be on the same cache line. Um, and then we also showed that you know, even when we're doing something in column major order, so every element's on a different cache line, because we're accessing using a constant stride between these uh, different accesses, the prefetcher can help us out and, you know, kind of boost our performance a bit. And then we showed that um, in something like random accesses, so we're accessing random cache line, there's not a set stride, you know, that caused our performance to drop by about 10x compared to the uh, even the column major um, accesses. So they're still accessing the same amount of cache lines. One of them gets prefetching, the other one, prefetch, the prefetcher can't really help. Okay, um, and then we also showed that, um, you know, a while ago now, we showed the same kind of access pattern uh, implications of performance when it comes to virtual function calls. Now, this was in the context of branch prediction, and we showed that, you know, because, you know, a call to a virtual function is just going to be a branch to a function. Uh, when we did these uh, calls, you know, to the same object, right, to the same implementation of a function from the same object, and we did say 10,000 of one type, 10,000 of another type, and then 10,000 of another type, well, the branch predictor has a really easy job there. It knows which, you know, one to uh, call next. It may just miss it, you know, at the boundaries, switching between objects. So then we randomized it, and we shuffled around the vector of objects, and then we started accessing random virtual functions. And we showed that this caused performance to drop by about 5x, right? And this is just by accessing the pattern, uh, accessing these functions differently. So, you know, fundamentally, we're still calling 30,000 of these functions. Now, uh, we're just doing it in a random order. So in the same kind of vein, we're going to talk about caches today um, and talk about cache associativity and how that the stride that we choose um, to access our data with can greatly impact performance. So the first thing we need to do is talk about caches and the different way ca ways caches are designed. So the first way caches are typically designed is um, this thing called a direct map cache. Now this is just the most simple kind of cache. And so we can use just a, a simple box, right? And we'll pretend that it has four different bins in it. Now each of these bins can hold what's known as a cache block. A cache block is just typically how we move data around in the memory system. So it'll typically be 64 bytes. We typically don't move things, say, at the byte granularity. Um, so here we've got four spaces, right, in our cache, right? So in this case, um, we've got, you know, 64 bytes times four. Um, so that's going to be, let's see, 64 times four. It's going to be two to the six times two to the two is two to the eight. So we have 256 bytes here. Okay, so with a direct map cache, let's think about just cache lines in terms of numbers. All right, so we have 0, 1, 2, and 3 here. So what happens with the fourth cache line in our system, right? So we're thinking about these in terms of consecutive addresses. So with a direct map cache, you can think of it as just like a simple modulo operator, right? So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right, so um, what's the benefits of something like a direct map cache? Well, it's very easy to figure out where a cache block needs to go. Right, if I just do mod 4 on the number, I can figure out very easily which uh, bin this cache block belongs to. Right, if say 0 is the address or 5 is the address, right, these are pretend addresses, but um, the idea still holds. Um, the hard so the hardware is going to be incredibly simple, um, and it makes things like cache replacement incredibly easy, right? So if four comes in, it knows I need to kick out zero, and I'll take its place. Now, where does the problem come in with direct mapped caches? So it's actually when we have a fairly common pattern where we're accessing maybe two different uh, maybe two different cache blocks that map to the same bin, right? So here we just kicked out zero when we loaded in four. Well, what happens when we try to load in zero now? Well, we've got to kick out four again, zero comes in, four goes out. What happens when we load four again? We have to kick out zero, four comes in, zero comes out. All the while, these blocks remain empty, right? So if we're just accessing these two, we can get this kind of pathological case in a direct map cache. Okay, so that seems bad. 
Uh, how do we get around this? Well, the kind of extreme other end to get around this is with uh, something that's known as a uh, um, a fully associative cache, right? So here, right, we'll write F A. So here's our fully associative cache. So I'm not going to draw any bins in here, and the main reason is because a cache block could go anywhere, right? So we could have you know zero here, seven, two, three, but you know six could also be here, five here. This could be a two. This could be the zero now. So you know the main benefit is this flexibility so we can shove a cache block in any one of the bins um, they're not specifically mapped to a particular location now the problem comes in with finding a uh, a cache block and uh, also um, replacing a cache block so when the direct map cache if we want to find a cache block well we can just do it in this case a simple modulo and we know exactly which cache block it is um, if we want to replace a cache block well there's only one thing that can fit into that um, space so we can just kick out what's ever there and uh, store something there so the difficulty with a fully associative cache is that this too could be in any one of these bins so we don't know exactly which bin it belongs to so what we end up having to do is we have to pull them all out and we have to compare them right so here's our input say address and we have to compare all of these to see if it's even in the cache right and then when it comes to replacement we have to say you know if we need to replace something in the cache well there's a lot of work that goes into replacement policies so you want to use maybe the one that's been used least um, so you want to kick out that one maybe okay so that's direct map that's fully associative so the problem with direct map is okay well we could get this pathological case where we end up kicking out the same element and we're not really utilizing our cache all that much. With fully associative, we can use the cache as much as we want because we've got this kind of full flexibility. But the problem is in hardware, right? So all of these comparators, especially when we make big caches, right? All of these comparators will get very, very expensive, right? And this could be very costly. So the compromise is what's known as a set associative cache, right? So we'll just denote this as SA, right? And I'll just put this as kind of a two-tiered thing that way it can separate a couple things so with a set associative cache let's say that we've got um, you know the same number of spaces four but now we have say way uh, zero and then way one and then we have set zero and then we have set one right so in this case what we really care about is um, so the, the ways refer to how many spaces we have to store something that is mapped to set zero, right? So when we're doing, say, um, and when we're trying to figure out where a cache block belongs, we can just do maybe, we can just do something like mod two, right? So um, in this case, you know, zero would map here, one would map here, two would map here, three would map here, right? So pretty intuitive so far. So where does the um, where does the benefit of a set associative cache come in, right? So the benefit comes in. We can just use that example of zero and four again, right? So we know that zero and four will map to the same set, right? So here we're just doing mod two instead of mod four like here, but now we've got choices now. So if if zero goes in here, right, we'll miss on zero. We'll load it in. Then what happens is we'll load in four. Four comes in. Now we've got four in our cache, right? In a direct map cache, this would overwrite. In a uh, set associative cache, we've got two different ways or two different places to store that uh, cache block, right? And so here, right, um, in the fully associative cache, what's the problem? Well, now we have to have, say, four comparators just to figure out where zero is. In this case, we only have to have two comparators, right? So it's kind of just a middle ground between the two. And there's spaces for both, right? So um, fully associative cache caches they work very well in small structures where you know the full so the it, the full associativity isn't that expensive. So something in say like a victim cache. So maybe we'll read that paper from Norm Jopi uh, sometime. Uh, victim caches are very small, maybe four or eight entry caches that uh, that are fully associative, right? And because they're so small. Um, it turns out that that full associativity doesn't really cost anything. Okay, so that's kind of the basics of caches here. 
Uh, now, the problem that we want to address with something like a set associative cache is this uh, access pattern that can go on. So let's say we're accessing things at a stride of four, right? So if we're accessing things, you know, maybe we can start at a stride of one first, right? So if we're accessing things at a stride of one, right? So maybe we'll start with zero, one, two, three, and then we go back here, four, go back here, five, right? So we're still using our entire cache. Not a lot of problems here. Now let's take a very different approach. Let's say that we're doing a strided access and we're doing it, say, a stride of four, right? So now we're doing zero, four, eight, uh, 12, 16, right? So uh, this is the kind of access pattern that we're talking about when you know we can get into pathological cases that can be bad for performance. So with the set associative cache, if we start accessing at a power of two stride like this, where we end up just kind of all going to the same set, within this set, we only have two different ways to store um, a cache block, right? We can only store it in way zero or in way one. So if all of our elements, right, based upon the stride that we're accessing something, map to the same set, right, we're going to run into problems because A, we're not using the other sets, and then B, we're constantly kicking out things uh, in the limited number of uh, ways in the set that we do have. So how can we show this inside of, you know, real hardware? Well, we can get a lot of, we can get all this information and we can play around with this, right, using Google Benchmark. So if you want to know more about your caches, you can, um, you can use something like CPU ID. CPU ID will tell you a lot of information. Uh, you might have to download it, uh, so you can just use a package manager like a, a pseudo apt get install CPU ID, and so you can get information. So let's say let's look at our L2 cache, right? So you see our L2 cache, um, L2 unified cache, right? So our cache line size is unsurprisingly 64 bytes. It's pretty common. It's a uh, 256 k cache right. right so this is going to be 2 to the 18 um, kilobytes um, and then we also have its eight-way associative right so we looked at something with two ways this is something with eight ways right um, so a lot more flexibility than our simple example but it's the same idea there's just more ways now so let's look at a benchmark that really shows off you know how we can you know test you know these problems out um, Okay, let's open up prefetching. Oh, wrong, wrong benchmark. Um, let's open up uh, associativity. That's what we want, right? So here, all we're going to do is we're going to have a pretty big array, so 32 megabytes, right? So two to the 25. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to have a, an input that's going to be the stride of which we're going to access our data. So this is going to start from zero and go all the way to 16. So our stride will be two to the zero. So just uh, one element after another, then it'll be two elements, right? So zero, two, four, uh, four, six, eight, and then it'll be every four, every eight, every 16, 32, 64, all the way up to two to the 16, which is 65. Uh, no, two to the 16 is going to be, uh, yeah, 65, 5, 36. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and so we're going to see this problem with associativity, right? So, you know, even in, you know, highly optimized architectures, right, you can still force some you know, bad performance by not understanding what's going on, not understanding things like cache associativity, right? And there's a lot of things to prevent this um, inside of the architecture itself, but, you know, it can't prevent everything. So let's go ahead and compile this and let's look at it, right? So you see that when we're at very, very um, a small stride, we're going to get very good performance. And the reason why is we're getting multiple elements on each cache line. Um, so once we're at, you know, 0, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, all of these elements are on the same cache line, right? So, or rather, you know, we at least have one, two elements on the same cache line. Once we get to, to the 6, so this is 64 bytes now. So we're striding over an array of, of, of uh, characters or chars. So once we get to 64, we're exceeding the size. So now every element, it's on its own cache line, but this doesn't cause too much of a performance hit. Then we see we go up a little bit more, right? We end up seeing more and more and more of a performance hit until we start getting to say uh, two to the 12, where we really cap out. So 
once we're doing a stride of 4096, we're really starting to test uh, to you know put pressure on the associativity of our caches and the number of the limited number of ways we have in our caches. So you know from here from our good locality case, right? This is about a 10x slowdown, right? And even when we start using different cache lines around here, so at two to the six, we're on different cache lines. It's still you know roughly the same as if they were on the same cache line, right? And if you even go one more. This is still roughly, you know, a 10x or maybe maybe a little bit less, maybe like an 8x uh, slowdown in comparison, right? So this is why it's really important to understand, you know, not only what we, uh, you know, not only the code we write and maybe you know how we can optimize the code, but making sure that our code is optimized for the architecture as well, uh, because these are things that, in terms of you know the actual code itself, right here we're having in this automatically generated input here. 0 and 16, but you know this change is as simple as, uh, you know, in a very good case we could have, you know, one shifted over, you know, five times or six times, right? And those are good cases still. That's two to the six. We saw that it's, that still was only uh, about 17 microseconds, right? In order to to you know iterate over this giant or iterate over. 10,000 elements in this uh, very big 32 megabyte array. But if we in increase this, you know, all the way up to say 2 to the, you know, 10 or 11 or 12, we saw that this can cause a 10x slowdown, right? And, you know, intuitively this, this you know, if we're just thinking of, you know, in terms of the cache, uh, the cache line size, we would just assume, hey, these are all on different cache lines. Right? Why isn't the performance the same? But we have to understand saying things like associativity to figure out you know why performance can change so radically with different access patterns. But that's going to go ahead and do it for today. As always, feel free to check out any of my stuff at github.com slash coffee before arch. So we've got stuff on GPU programming, CPU pro uh, GPU programming, CPU programming, like C, Python, parallel programming. So we looked at C crash course and the optimization section. And we looked at associativity today. So uh, feel free to check this out. Let me know if you have any questions. There's some great uh, resources online for learning more about associativity. And we'll learn more about it inside of, the, uh, uh, inside of my uh, computer architecture series. But like I said, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.